<laughs> who would have thought? Who would have thought that the under 30 crowd would use Facebook and Twitter to overthrow dictatorships that were stable for 50 years? When you talk about augmented reality, um, one of the things I was wondering just on the way over here to do this interview, as I was driving down the road, I was imagining what it would be like to drive down the road looking through augmented reality glasses, and I thought, what if I didn't want it? Uh, or, or what if it gets in the way? Is there a problem with the ethics of changing the way our children start viewing the world where they're so used to looking through a computer lens that they maybe don't recognize a tree for a tree? Well, our grandkids will come up to us one day and say, Grandpa, Grandma, how could you possibly live in a world that was dumb? <laughs> when a chair was just a chair, when a contact lens was just a contact lens, when a table was just a table. Because our grandkids will simply take it for granted that there are chips everywhere, everywhere and nowhere. In fact, our grandkids won't even use the word computer, just like today we don't use the word electricity. No one says the word electricity anymore, and yet electricity is everywhere and nowhere, hidden in the walls, the ceiling. We automatically look for the light switch every time we walk into a room. In the future, we will assume that the wallpaper is intelligent, that we have plastic transistors in the wall, and we'll talk to the wall. We'll ask the wall to change color, to change design, to create a video screen, to lock on to our friends so that we can play a bridge game. And if the walls are 360 degrees around you, create The Matrix. The movie The Matrix is not so far-fetched. And if you're a Trekkie and a Star Trek fan, this will be the holodeck. So your living room will be coated with intelligent wallpaper so that you can play any video game, imagine you're anywhere, talk to your friends, teleconference with anybody in the world and basically act like you're in Star Trek. So you don't have to be in the 24th century. We'll have it perhaps in 10 to 15 years. Intelligent wallpaper. I want my own personal holodeck. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. It's coming faster than you realize. You talk about regenerating organs uh, oh, yeah. from stem cells. Um, I'm one of the survivors of polio. Will that also apply to developing muscles as well as organs? Can they regenerate? Uh, yes, even without stem cells, already we can create from your own cells, we can create cartilage, noses, ears, bones, blood, blood vessels, heart valves, the first full bladder was grown four years ago. The first windpipe was grown for a woman last year. And in five years' time, we'll probably grow the first liver from your own liver cells. So if you're an alcoholic out there, take heart. We may be able to cure alcoholism by simply growing a new liver as livers wear out. And so the human body shop is not so far-fetched. And with stem cells, we should be able to create entire organs like lung tissue, heart tissue that are quite complicated. The previous tissues that I mentioned were created out of sponge. You take plastic sponge and seed it with ordinary cells that then are hit with growth factors. These cells proliferate into the plastic mold and the plastic is biodegradable, leaving a perfect ear or a perfect nose. But you see, there's a problem there. Blood vessels are very difficult to reproduce. That's where stem cell technology comes in. Because stem cell technology in principle can reproduce the entire organ. Now for mice, we, there's a video on the internet where you can see a beating mouse heart being grown from scratch. I tell you, man, this is almost biblical looking at a mouse heart being grown from nothing, and then it starts to beat, or seeing a rat with its spinal cord cut, unable to walk, suddenly, after a few months, being able to use all four limbs to walk. This is almost something right out of the Bible. 
And that's something that we already can do with animals. There's, there's a lot of research uh, and development and advances that have been made in prosthetic limbs. People coming back from uh, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, who have lost a leg can get a, a metal or a plastic or a synthetic leg attached and then they're out skateboarding, skiing, snowboarding. Does that mean that uh, as stem cell research advances these will become obsolete or is there a place for a partnership? It'll be probably a merger uh, specific to the person's injury. If you get a salamander and you rip off an arm or a leg or there's an accident, the salamander grows back an arm or a leg, right? And how does it do that? Stem cells. That's how salamanders do it. That's how reptiles do it. We can't do it. But we can also tease the stem cells of our own body to create entire organs. Now, with respect to organs now, we can create cochlear implants that give back the sense of, of hearing to those people who have injury to their eardrum or injury, injury to their uh, nervous system. We can do that. Now with eyesight, we're creating cameras miniature cameras that can actually receive impulses and shoot it to the optic nerve. Or we can actually put chips right in the retina of an eye. So the eye begins to see a grid of pixels. Eventually we hope to get maybe a thousand or so pixels right there inside the retina of an eyeball and restore the sense of sight. So how far can it go? Well, you just extrapolate into the next several decades and you begin to realize that we might be able to surpass human abilities to create supermen and superwomen and that one day we'll wake up with a perfect body, perhaps an immortal body, perhaps a body that is super strong. This is well within the realm of possibility and it's something that's being looked at very seriously now. How will we deal with information overload? We can put uh, huge quantities of information into computers, but it can almost overwhelm the mind. How well, will yes people... and no. You realize that most of the internet is junk. And so in the future, <laughs> wisdom, wisdom will be prized by people. When you first get on the internet, you're thrilled with all this junk, with all these ideas, bizarre conspiracy theories that you've never heard before. So at first, when you get onto the internet, you get that rush, thinking that, wow, all these conspiracy theories, maybe some of them are correct. However, after a while, you begin to get numb to all this, and then you begin to seek out wisdom. And so in the future, we'll have filters. We'll be able to identify the people we trust, the news that we can depend upon. And so once in a while, yeah, we'll go back into these conspiracy theories and have a wild ride. But then when you want the truth or you want to have wisdom, you'll go back to your, your trusted people and rely upon that information. And also, let me tell you something historically. When the telephone was first invented decades and decades ago, there were people that argued against the telephone. They said that we're no longer gonna have dinner table conversations with our family friends, and we'll spend all our time talking to disembodied voices from the ether. Well, the critics were right. We do spend less time talking to our friends, talking to our loved ones at dinner, and we do talk to these disembodied voices from the ether, and you know something? We love it. <laughs> because our circle of acquaintances expanded from maybe 10 to thousands. And now with the internet, children think nothing of playing video games with a kid from Russia, a kid from Australia. They have more in common with somebody in China than they do their next door neighbor. So all this noise is democratizing. That's the point I'm getting. And Democracies never war with other democracies. Think of every war you've read about since you were in grade school. They've always been between monarchies and dictatorships, but never between two democracies. So as we have all this noise out there, with it comes democracy, and with it comes the overthrow of dictatorships. Realize that the dictators of the Middle East have been there for a half a century. Nothing could budge these dictatorships except Twitter. <laughs> Who would have thought? 
Who would have thought that the under 30 crowd would use Facebook and Twitter to overthrow dictatorships that were stable for 50 years? So you're absolutely right. We do live with clutter. We do live with conspiracy theories. We live with noise. But overall, it's worth it. So when there's only democracies left, um, uh, are you saying that then we'll have found the cure for war? No, war is politics by other means, said von Clausewitz, the famous Austrian military theorist. We'll always have political conflicts because there's debates about uh, boundary lines, taxation, uh, who's going to pay for this or that. And so there will be conflicts, and some of that will actually spill over into armed conflict. But major wars, major wars will become a thing of the past. We'll have skirmishes, we'll have uh, night raids and vigilantes and stuff like that. But major wars we're simply not going to have as we have more democracies. Or we could have dictatorships like North Korea, where they fear not just the internet, they fear the radio. If you get a radio in North Korea, there's only one frequency on it, and that is the frequency of the Communist Party. And so there may be a few holdouts, dictatorships, that basically strangle all forms of news because they want their people to think that if they're starving, the entire world is starving. So why bother to revolt if everyone is starving? That's why dictatorships want to monopolize the truth. And that's where the Internet comes in. In the future, you'll be able to download the Internet off your ring, off your contact lens, from satellites in outer space. So it's going to be more and more difficult for even dictatorships like North Korea to keep the Internet out. Wow.